Welcome to the Low Carb Lifestyle Podcast. Today I'm here with Dr. Alex from Sydney Low Carb Specialist. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Tracy. It's fantastic to have you here, Alex. Can you start by sharing with everybody um, a little bit about you and what got you into the low carb space? Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Dr. Alex Petrzewski. I've trained as a as a GP. I work um, in general practice and Along with my wife, Dr. Deepa Mahananda, we, we both run a, a low carbohydrate um, clinic in Sydney called Sydney Low Carb Specialist. We offer a doctor dietitian service, so we work alongside two uh, qualified dietitians who have a specialty interest in low carbohydrate nutrition. Uh, so often we will see patients together and, um, and sort of take them through the low carb journey. We see a variety of um, patients for various illnesses and diseases, uh, and we use a variety of different nutritional strategies ranging from uh, relaxed low carb all the way through to carnivore and incorporating therapeutic fasting and everything in between. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so obviously, personally, you, you're a big believer in the low carb um, nutrition. So you know, how did that look for you? And, and you know, it's just an, I just find it a fascinating journey because most people have kind of come into the space because of a personal, you know, health issue or is it just been out of interest for you? Yeah, so um, you're spot on. So as with a lot of low carbohydrate uh, health providers, my, I've got a personal story. So my personal story is I was always overweight when I was younger. Um, I've always struggled with my weight um, and with you know cravings and uh, regular eating and never feeling full. Um, I broadly tried some vague nutritional strategies when I was younger, which broadly approximate caloric restriction. And as you're probably aware, it doesn't work well for most people. Um, so it's always been a bit of a problem. And then in the background, my family history is one of a profound risk for type 2 diabetes on both sides of my family. So it's, it's very strongly linked in our family tree. Um, so in medical school, we were taught about you know, type 2 diabetes, how it's different from type 1. And the typical advice that you would get is, you know, it's a progressive disease. Um, you start off with lifestyle measures that invariably don't work. You end up on one medication and two medications and three medications, and eventually you're gonna end up on insulin um, at some stage. And along that way, maybe you get a heart attack or a stroke, maybe you lose vision in an eye or you lose a toe or a foot, or you get put on dialysis. So these are all the sort of typical complications that are just piling up everywhere in our health system from type two diabetes. So that was the, the typical teaching and as with most things in medical school, the nutritional teaching was fairly arbitrary and minimal. So we were just taught to basically give these patients regular carbohydrates, which never really made too much sense to me. Um, once, once we started practicing in general practice, we could see these patients along that whole spectrum of you know, either at the start of the diagnosis or towards the end. And as a general rule, it was, it was difficult and you didn't get much success in terms of you know, reversing this disease process. So along the way, uh, my wife and I, we both became um, aware of things like the CSIRO low carb diet or, or paleolithic diet. Um, and eventually we stumbled across the, ke across the ketogenic diet. And we thought, you know, for our own health, why don't we give it a try? Um, we did. And you know, the results were quite astounding and, and quite quick and marked. So, you know, not only personally, not only was weight loss something that happened very quickly and was very effortless, but also, you know, we noticed the other non-scale victories that we often talk about with patients so increased energy better sleep um, much stronger appetite control myself being a migraine sufferer much fewer migraines so so the results were quite stark um, uh, so you know once we sort of noticed that in ourselves the, the next logical extension was well, let's try it on patients and you know mm. we started slowly um, just with the patients that were most likely going to be receptive and, and easiest ones to treat and um and again, got dramatic results. And as a clinician, once once you see those results, you can't unsee them. Um, and then once you're starting to take patients off medications and then other patients are asking them what they're doing and then they come to see you as well, it sort of builds up quite quickly because in the community, there is this sort of sense of, you, I want you know, a, a, an actual solution. So when people see that there's a potential solution, a lot of them are very interested in finding out what, what it could be because they also understand that if the, the alternative is the medication roundabout um, that eventually is going to end up with end stage diabetes or end stage renal failure or whatever it might be. Um, so that's how the practice grew over a couple of years. You know, we both deeper and myself, we developed quite a, a patient following. And then 
then we were quickly realizing that our typical GP days were getting inundated with, with low carb practice. Um, and as you're probably aware, the typical general practice consult length is either 10 or 15 minutes. And for, for most low carbohydrate consults, especially towards the start, that is grossly inadequate. There's not enough time to get <clears throat> everything done properly. So we decided, why don't we set aside some time at a special location where we could actually practice just, just low carbohydrate nutrition, where we could give the patients the time to do it. So our initial consults in our clinic are an hour long. So, and even that sometimes is not quite enough, but it gives us a lot of time to go through things in a thoroughly holistic way. And then our follow-ups are usually half an hour. So again, there's time to go through everything properly. Um, so so that's, did, that's how we sort of put it off to the side and then we can yeah. do our general practice uh, on other days that way. So you're still doing that? So you've still got your general practice, uh, um, yep. you know, it, it's somewhere like just in a normal sort of, Yep. clinic or yeah. You, yeah okay and then you, yeah. I didn't realize so we have that, days right? where we yeah we have days where we divide so when we're working at our clinic at Sydney low carb it's just low carb and then yeah and I myself work at another practice where I'm doing more more uh sort of standard general practice although again when patients see me there and they've got diabetes or something it's hard to separate the two you know once it's ingrained mm -hmm. in your practice it does sort of bleed into other areas as well so mm. um, it's a bit of a challenge in that regard but you know at the end of the day low carbohydrate general practice is just good general practice it's, it's being prevented it's taking preventative care seriously and it's um, looking at patients holistically so to me it's not mutually exclusive it's just more of a logistical issue of how you make it work yeah exactly so how did you find your colleagues when you um decided to sort of do this have you experienced any sort of you know kickback or you know i don't know <laughs> not, not quite kickback <laughs> Yeah, I'm lucky. I work in a very uh, open-minded practice, a very collegiate okay. practice. It's just got yeah. over 14 GPs there. So, so when we first started doing it personally, um, we'd get weird looks at lunchtime when it comes to what we were eating at lunch. And then, <laughs> you know, I lost a lot of weight, so there are a few. You know, are you okay? Are you sick? Uh, um, but yeah. after that, once it became apparent that you know we were doing this with patients as well, I think there was a bit of apprehension, or at least a little bit of curiosity um yeah i don't think all of my colleagues are completely on board but i would say again once you see the results it's very hard to argue with results so yeah. i would say now about half of the practitioners i work with will refer patients to me for weight issues or diabetes management or something like that as, as an option so so i'd like That's to right. say that you know a lot of gps are open-minded when it comes to results mm -hmm. um, and not being too dogmatic and at the yeah. end of the day, even in our low carb clinic, we're the same. We're not dogmatic, so if, you know, we're results driven. So if yeah. something's not working, we're not afraid to change tack and, and change things up. Yeah, yeah. So how do you decide with your patients where to start them? Because it's often a big, um, you know, certainly with the work I do, you know, going from the standard um, Australian diet, you know, do, do you kind of ease them into it? Do you, you know, like... How, do, how does it look? I mean, I know it's going to be intuitive and a very one-on-one -on -one basis, but, you know, say someone yep. comes to you, you know, they're typical eater of the standard Australian diet. Like you wouldn't mm. obviously go from that to carnivore, you know, would you? Or like how would you mm. or how do you decide where to start, you know, yeah. a patient when they first come to you? Yeah, so I guess you'd, you'd need to divide it into patient factors and disease factors. So a part of it's going to come down to where they are in terms of their ability to do what you ask them to do or their willingness to, to make it restrictive and, you know, whether they've got family around or whether they've got that they have to cook for or whether they've got other time commitments that are going to make a strict, strict diet hard. So you really do have to take that into account. There's no point giving them an intervention that they can't do. It's going to be useless. And then you've got to look at the disease factors. So, so a, part, a big part of our initial consult is, is trying to figure out how severe their issue is. So, you know, on one, on one end of the spectrum, you may have someone who is just a bit overweight or, you know, had a, a grade one obesity where everything else looks okay. They don't have any other medical problems, but they just, you know, they're just excessively snacking or they're just doing the wrong thing that they've been told to do. They're a bit easier and they're much more likely to get away with a more liberal approach. And I guess down the other end, you've got patients who have underlying autoimmune conditions where, you know, if they really want to treat them, then a, a relaxed approach is less likely to work. 
Mm. Um, or, you know, if they've got severe nutritional deficiencies, we have to be a bit more aggressive with, with, with fixing them or, um, you know, every once in a while have someone who's got epilepsy or, or some other condition that, you know, requires a very specific uh, variant of low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet where, you know, it, it's, the goals are a bit different. So they are really pursuing high ketosis, for instance. So, so I mean, the answer as always is it depends. Mm. Um, mm. If someone needs some of that more stricter intervention, but they're not quite ready for them, we're more than happy to start off with gentle steps and work them down because we understand that not everyone's willing to just go from standard diet to a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet overnight. That's, it is quite intimidating for a lot of people who are just not, not up to date with all this or not in this space. It can seem yeah. like a radical change. So, so we will do that sometimes. We would just get them off processed food first, we get them off sugar first, and then slowly work back. At the end of the day, our, our clinic philosophy is to give people as many options as they can as they can get away with for what they want to to treat. Yeah, yeah, no, so that sounds great. So, in in terms of what you see, what are some of the biggest hurdles or the biggest uh, you know obstacles that you see? you know, do get in the way of people trying to make these lifestyle changes? Yeah, so I would say the biggest obstacles we first of all society. Everyone is living in a very obesogenic society now in COVID more than ever, where, you know, people have potentially, um, you know, some stress management options not available to them if they're stuck at home. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, financial pressures and all that sort of thing. Um, you only have to look at, you know, how the quality of food that is being advertised to people is, is rarely healthy. So there are so many options out there and there are so many instances in a day where the average person has to say no to unhealthy food. In the past, yeah. they wouldn't have had to expend that emotional willpower you know, every half an hour when they're out and about. But these days, the reality is until you can get to the point where in your mindset where you just don't see that as food anymore, where you just don't see that as a viable things for you to eat you're expending a lot of willpower yeah and a lot of people find that difficult or they can do it for a little while and eventually the you know the willpower does run out so i think that's a major major issue if these foods didn't exist it'd be easier because you wouldn't have to say no because it wouldn't be an option um, but unfortunately yeah. it's everywhere um even just with the olympics on at the moment you see how much junk food is advertised by athletes which is just the supreme irony of it all um so that's that's one side of it is the environment that people are living in at the moment the other side is you know the cognitive dissonance of you know, i've been told for 30 years to eat this way and there's this one doctor and one dietitian is telling me to do the exact opposite of eating more fat eating more red meat eating more salt it just seems crazy on first <laughs> on first glance um so you a part of what we do is really walking them through the real history of all of this the evolutionary biology of why we're suggesting what we're doing. We find if patients understand why we're suggesting what we're doing, it makes it a bit easier. Because if you can really carry them through that explanation and get them on board, they're much more likely to do better, we find. And the patients who are hesitant, um, they're harder work uh, because if they've got that nagging doubt in their brain, then you know it does make it a little bit harder for them to stay firm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's probably some of the big challenges. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a yeah. big challenge I see as well. I mean, even just with, you know, particularly for women, you know, the overcoming of fat, I mean, it's been so ingrained yeah. in us that it's, you know, going to make us fat and, you know, I mean, well, it's probably one of the biggest things I see with my clients that they start with me, you know, and one of the questions I have on my form, health form is, you know, tell me what you think about fat and, uh, you know, most of the time, it's, uh, you know, I'm a bit scared of it. And that's, mm. you know, obviously that's just because that's what we've been told. That's what I thought. That's what I was told for so many years. And, I mean, I remember telling my mum, what are you doing? Stop eating butter, you know, you know, go to, you know, low fat, everything. And when I finally understood that was wrong and I went, oh, mum, you know how I've been telling you for years to go low fat and said, so oh, just go back to what you were doing before. <laughs> She's like, oh, my. <laughs> Long overdue yeah. apology. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Well, I, I think it's really, you know, what's important to know is that, you know, all of that can be overcome. So it's it's definitely, you know, it's it's good to be aware of what the hurdles are, but know that there are strategies and there's people and there's lots of things that we can do to overcome it. And it's not an overnight thing, but that's okay. It, it, it might yeah. take time, but we have to know that it can definitely be overcome. And the whole, uh, you know, I mean, 
when I first started as well. Gee, I mean, there was no way I could I could look at a table of hot chips for my thing and a chocolate and stuff. And you know, there's no way I, I ever thought I could not be you know influenced by it. But now I just have no thought on it. It's just stuff I look at it, and it is that is absolutely possible. You know, it doesn't have to you know control us when we can see you know how to overcome all that sort of stuff. So yeah, fantastic. Um, before I um, I also want to ask you about what the work that you do in oncology, but I think while we're on the topic of low carb, can we talk a little bit about, um, I guess, what I sort of call the superhero cape of low carb? I think, you know, when we come into understanding low carb and we make the changes and we feel amazing, um, I think sometimes we forget, um, I guess, that other factors still come into play in terms of our health, like our genetics, um, you know, our history, you know, we may have been eating a certain way for 40 years before finding low carb, you know, it's not necessarily going to be something that's going to protect us from, you know, all the diseases like heart disease and things like that. So, you know, in terms of your understanding around this, um, you know, I'd just love you to share some in your insight around, you know, maybe a little bit more common sense around understanding the bigger picture of, of health and it's not just necessarily about the diet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're spot on, Tracy. So, I mean, low carbohydrate nutrition in, in all of its different forms is a, is a fantastic intervention for improving your health um, and fixing a variety of diseases. But it, we really have to be mindful that we're not all bulletproof just because we're in ketosis or just because we're not eating grains or, or trans fats. Um, so, so, you know, with genetics, certainly play a part and you know we we do see a, a lot of the harder cases that seek us out in our low carb clinics the patients who either are doing all the right things and just seemingly are not getting results or they're doing all the right things and have been for a few years and and some of their biomarkers are not looking as good as you would otherwise expect so these patients are out there um, that is the trouble with working with people is we're all different and some people just don't play by the established rules we know a lot about the science of low carbohydrate nutrition now, but in the grand scheme of things, there are still lots of unknowns. So they are going to be the 1% or the 5% of patients who don't behave like everyone else. A lot of your listeners will be certainly well aware of the phenomenon of uh, lean mass hyperresponders or these minority of patients whose cholesterol uh, does quite different things on a low carbohydrate diet. That subject lots of speculation and study uh, in terms of n equals ones, but not really any randomized control trials. So these patients do have to accept some uncertainty in terms of their long-term risk of things like heart disease or stroke. What we can tell patients is, you know, these are the suite of biomarkers we use. We do lots of extensive testing to look at these things, but at the end of the day, there are going to be some patients whose genetics lets them down, or some patients who have specific needs that we just haven't figured out yet. Um, so mm. we do need to be mindful of our limitations. So, um, you know, for some patients that, that means taking supplements for certain things, but for some patients that mean, may mean prescribing them a stat and acknowledging the, the issues with that. Um, and some patients, even though they're doing all the right things may end up having heart disease or may end up developing a cancer or something else that we would you know, hope they didn't. Um, and so we have mm. to be mindful that. In those situations, the pharmacological therapies or the surgical therapies absolutely come into play because if we're dogmatic about things, then we are letting our patients down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's such great advice. Um, and um, can you talk a little bit about those hyper-responders? I mean, it, you know, on a blanket sort of, you know, knowledge, you know, we know that total cholesterol in and of itself isn't um, a, a risk factor that we should necessarily be concerned about. But in these people, could it be? Does that just require more um, more delving, if you like? So, yeah, absolutely. These patients with high LDL, they do need to be treated differently. Um, in our clinic, the, the approach we take is these patients have got a high LDL, that they've got more kindling uh, in their bloodstream for a fire. So it's, it's just especially important to make sure there's no, there's no sparks going on. So that means, you know, these patients really should have um, advanced lipid testing, so lipid subfractions looking for small dense LDL, oxidized LDL. Depending on their age, they really should consider having non-invasive cardiac imaging, so things like CT coronary angiogram or a coronary calcium score, as long as it's age appropriate to, uh, to track uh, potential atherosclerosis changes over time. 
these patients absolutely should not be smokers because the effect of nicotine on their blood vessels. And then really looking at all the other residual risk uh, components, so things like homocysteine, inflammation, um, autoimmune disease, all of these things. At the end of the day, uh, if you've got a high LDL, that's, that's necessary to get an atherosclerotic plaque, but it's not sufficient. So you need the LDL in the wrong place at the wrong time, but you also need an inflamed blood vessel wall. You also need some degree of genetic susceptibility. So for these patients, they really need to work on those other factors. And in theory, if they can mitigate all of those, the LDL itself should not put them at um, specifically increased risk of having atherosclerosis. On the flip side, LDL has an important role when it comes to immune function as well. So anecdotally, these patients report they don't seem to get sick often um, with common colds and all that sort of thing. And there's certainly an association between uh, high LDL and, and cancer risk. So again, LDL is important in immune surveillance when it comes to preventing cancer. So, so some people have certain, certainly made the argument that if you want to give people medication to bring their LDL down, you're really fighting a battle of heart disease on one end and cancer on the other. Statins have been associated with the small increased risk of cancer and low LDL itself is associated with poor longevity as well. So that's all very much in, in keeping with you know, evolutionary biology of uh, thinking that these things are not there for no reason. Um, we've got LDL cholesterol in the bloodstream for good reason. It's there, it's doing something. Mm -hmm. So any anything that alters that is potentially going to have other side effects. That's a fantastic conversation because there's just so much misinformation out about that. And I think it's one of the, the areas that even when people come into low carb that, you know, if their cholesterol goes up, they do freak out because they don't quite understand what's going on. And then, of course, a lot of their doctors don't. And, I yeah. mean, that's, it is, uh, yeah, it's just such an important area to understand. But as you say, you know, there is just, there's still a lot of unknowns. There's still a lot of uh, N equals one. You know, we really have to look at the individual and, you know, you would you guys are just so fantastic with the work that you're doing um in terms of helping people understand all this it's great thank you so moving on then um you are very interesting have done a background in oncology as well i'd love you to share um a little bit around what that looks like what you've seen um yeah. Yeah. So, so before I got into general practice, I actually worked as a trainee radiation oncologist in Sydney for, for three and a half years. So working in a variety of different hospitals. So I worked in some fantastic departments um, with quite a lot of advanced technology. But at, at the end of the day, during the hospital training that I had, it was very much focused on treatment. Um, there are really three main components of cancer care you could think of. One is prevention, one is treatment, and the third is survivorship. And so when you work in hospital, you really focus on treatment. Um, you've got patients who have potentially curable cancers and you're really trying to maximise how many of them survive their cancer while at the same time minimising the, the toxicity or the side effects or long-term complications of treatment. So you don't really get to see the preventative side of things and that's really typically general practice territory. And you also don't really get to see what happens to patients afterwards in terms of survivorship you're always hoping with these curable cancers they do survive and they don't get a recurrence. But um, a lot of the time in oncology, the cure has a cost. Um, so, so I would see that as well in patients who would come back. Um, we'd have late effects clinics and you'd see the late complications of things like radiotherapy, whether it's a second cancer or fibrosis and scarring and issues of function to other organs that were caught in the, basically caught in the crossfire when you give them treatment. Um, it, in hospital care, holistic approaches to things are hard um, because treatment is often fragmented. So a typical cancer patient, uh, say a breast cancer patient is going to have a surgeon, they're going to have a medical oncologist, they're going to have a radiation oncologist. So on any given day, they might be seeing eight healthcare providers for various things. So it all becomes very fragmented. Mm -hmm. And so giving these patients a an overarching theme of what they should be doing is, is not impossible often. Um, so, so once we became interested in low carbohydrate nutrition and ketogenic nutrition, um, you know, one of the things we often tell people is eat more meat. It's very nutrient dense. It doesn't have carbohydrate. It's got a lot of protein. And I was finding that a lot of patients, once they, once you got them over the hurdle of eating carbs, a lot of, a lot of them would come back and say, well, doctor, you're asking me to eat a lot of meat. Isn't that going to give me cancer? And ironically, during my training, I just thought, well, yeah, red meat causes cancer. That's part of the you know part of the reading you do for your exams. Um, you know, it's associated with bowel cancer and whatnot. 
Um, but once I started delving into it, it actually became quite clear how tenuous and weak that relationship was. So, um, so you know, after doing a bit of research and, and presenting on this topic, it's, it's quite clear that the, the 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 advice about cancer mitigation in terms of not eating red meat or minimising red meat is ideological to agree, and it's very weak at best. Um, mm -hmm. So that was quite interesting. And then after that, I became aware of some of the, the emerging evidence in terms of ketogenic diets in terms of the treatment of cancer or as an adjunctive therapy for cancer. So I mentioned the three stages of the cancer journey to prevention, um, treatment and survivorship. Ketogenic diets in particular seem to have a potential role in all three. So, so we know that low carbohydrate diets are, are very efficient at treating insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is a major risk factor for cancers of all kinds. Cancer cells like the insulin, it's a, growth it's a growth factor. And if you are insulin resistant, you're much more likely to get a variety of different cancers. So, so as a prevention strategy, ironically, red meat might actually reduce someone's risk of getting cancer all up in the, in the grand scheme of things. There's some evidence that during ketogenic diets or keep nutritional ketosis or therapeutic ketosis can actually limit the effects of chemotherapy when it comes to nausea and other effects. And there's some really interesting data on um, ketosis and limiting radiation toxicity as well. There's not a lot of human data on this at the moment, um, but there is some, and it seems to be that um, all the pilot studies that are done show that ketogenic diet is completely tolerable in cancer patients. Unsurprisingly, it's very tolerable in everyone else. So there's no reason to think that they wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be something that's toler tolerable in them. Um, one of the concerns in cancer patients is not losing weight. So in this situation, um, you know, you have to balance that versus caloric restriction. You, you don't want cancer patients being on calorie restriction diets per se. Um, so making sure they get adequate nutrition during their treatment is really important. One caveat of this might be the role of therapeutic fasting. So there's some interesting data showing that therapeutic fasting might actually increase someone's um, ability to deal with toxic therapies. So there's actually a rat study that was done a few years ago, which took a bunch of rats and fasted them for 24 hours and then gave them a, a lethal dose of radiation. Um, and unsurprisingly, the control group of rats, they're all dead in a week. But the rats that fasted for 24 hours, they're all alive a week later now. Wow. Which is quite staggering. You're giving a 10 gray whole body dose to a rat, which would certainly kill it um, under normal circumstances. So the caveats here, obviously, it's a rat study, not a human study. And a 24-hour fast in a rat's equivalent to many a day fast in humans. But it just shows you how powerful an intervention these nutritional therapies can be, potentially. So mm. there are a lot of studies that are most likely going to be done in the near future. Um, one, one of the groups or one of the cancers that's most studied is high-grade gliomas or glioblastomas, which are aggressive brain tumors, which tend to be almost universally lethal. That is an easy group to study in some regards because, you know, if you're dealing with a, a cancer that has such a poor prognosis as a patient, you're going to be much more likely to, to pursue alternative avenues. And, and brain tumors themselves are very glycolytic, so they're very reliant on glucose. So, um, again, lots of potential synergy there with ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. It's interesting um, about this because I've, I've really, um, I've had a couple of ladies I've talked to around this and they've uncovered because they themselves have had cancer. So they've gone down this path mm -hmm. and, you know, really a lot of this, there's just so much evidence out there for, um, you know, ketones and ketosis diet and, and how, you know, cancer is driven by metabolic issues um, that was mm -hmm. done prior to the war. Um, you know, the, the German scientists have sort of had all this, sort of knowledge and then you know when the war came the germans lost the war the americans apparently have buried it, so much of this stuff and you know politics and all that sort of stuff came into it and you know i've read so much stuff around that and i find it fascinating how you know that well number one that can happen but how if we just look back a little bit and you know into history you know a lot of this stuff has been known for so long yep it, it's a so Gary Taubes also talked about how the German research on insulin resistance also got lost because of the war. So, in some respects, it's going to be supremely ironic that the fact that that research was lost is probably going to end up causing more deaths than World War Two itself, actually, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so it's a real, it's a really unfortunate yeah. um, outcome of all of that. 
So more recently, Thomas Seyfried, who's a, a cancer biologist and a cancer mm. researcher, has been doing a lot of work in this area. Um, at the moment, the state of play, it will be very difficult for any oncologist to recommend a ketogenic therapy as a primary therapy. Um, I don't think anyone would be able to do that safely without putting their registration at risk. But as an adjunct, it, it's certainly something that's worthwhile thinking about. And then, and then the other thing is the third stage of cancer journey is the survivorship. So there's evidence that's been around for quite some time. If you've got breast cancer and you lose weight after your treatment, you're less likely to die or to get a recurrence. If you've got bowel cancer and you, you finish your treatment and you lose weight afterwards, you're less likely to die of a recurrence. And there's some evidence that intermittent fasting can help um, improve breast cancer survivorship as well. So even after you've actually had your active treatment, so your surgery, your radiotherapy, your chemotherapy, there are things that are in your control that it can actually improve your risk of, of surviving and not getting a recurrence, which for many, for most cancer sufferers, that's something that's always in the, in the front of their mind is not getting a recurrence. So it's a very interesting area. It's, it's almost certainly going to be an active area of research, but part of the issue is just convincing a lot of doctors that this nutritional approach is, is that powerful. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you did a, uh, a lecture for the summit, which was fantastic all around this, um, the evidence around meat and cancer and uh, people watching, if you'd like to to listen to that it's been put up on the podcast so you can go and find that to have a look at it so one of the things um um peter ballastad has sort of said you know there's so much evidence around um lack of animal source foods and um you know not just cancer but just ill health poor health and then on the opposite spectrum there is none to very little around too much being an issue so i mean in terms of the whole protein intake you know meat animal source protein being of high quality there is just you know it's just really so there's so much out there around it but of course you know people the cognitive dissonance and agendas and all this stuff come into play and of course the message gets gets missed somewhere so along with um i guess meat being something that is obviously you know it's very beneficial for health so what are some of the other things that you could recommend for just people sitting there I mean they're just they're, you know I know you know you're just speaking as someone who's going can recommend things it's not mm -hmm. you know advice uh, but you know what are some of the other things that we know that could potentially reduce our risk of getting you know certain cancers cancer yep so so in terms of someone's overall cancer risk, if you're thinking about all cancers, um, mm -hmm. e the easy things to do are don't smoke, don't be around asbestos, don't drink alcohol to excess. They're the, the sort of three big ticket items that everyone can do that's going to dramatically reduce their risk of getting certain cancers. Beyond that point, um, not being insulin resistant would have to be the next priority. So because it mm -hmm. increases your risk of so many different cancers not being in some resistant would have to be the, the next step and you know whether that's through a low carb hydrate diet whether it's through a caloric restriction or intermittent fasting regimen however you get it done um i think it, it doesn't doesn't matter you're not being in some resistant or reversing your insulin resistance is going to re, you know reduce your overall risk of getting cancer when it comes to meat ideally as with many you know, areas the the healthier the meat the the higher the quality the better if you can get organic that's great when you're cooking your meat, we would normally recommend that you limit or don't char your meat consistently or not make a habit of that. Um, it's hard to quantify how big of a risk that is. So if you're having the occasional barbecue, it's not likely to be a big deal. But habitually charring your meat black is probably not ideal when it comes to the polycarbon load that you're going to get in there. And then obviously what you're cooking your meat in. So we typically recommend that the best thing to be frying in will be um, animal fats, hard fats, because they're more heat stable and less likely to oxidize yeah. certainly compared to seed oils and that sort of thing yeah can i just ask you about the charring because mm. that was a discussion my husband and i were having the other night that mm. it seems though you know that is actually one area that is actually a lot more solid in terms of risk of the charring and and you've just said that so that is that that's obviously the case it is i mean even it is not that solid but compared to the other mechanisms put forward as to why red meat is you know carcinogenic most of the others are nonsense so that one's pretty much right. the only one that has has some potential bearing some. Okay. okay yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. And again, hard to quantify if you're having a small amount, what difference that makes. Because all this, even the charring, it's all based on animal studies where they take rats and they feed them full of other carcinogens to pump them up and, yeah. and see what happens basically. Because if you're studying what causes cancer is really hard. Studying treatment of cancer is easy. If you've got a chemotherapy or regimen that doesn't work in someone who's got a cancer, whether it's a human or a rat, you're going to know quite quickly because they're going to die. Um, but carcinogenesis is hard because it takes 20, 30, 40 years to form a cancer. So mm. researchers can't keep hundreds of thousands of rats alive for that long and see what happens to identify subtle changes. So instead, what they do is they put the rats into the perfect environment for a cancer to form. So lots of other carcinogens give them a deficient, unbalanced diet and then hope that something happens to that in a, in a more, in a, in a high enough quantity that they can identify the the trend. So that's it's a very artificial environment. It doesn't it doesn't extrapolate very well to humans, but within the confines of that, it seems that you know high polycarbon loads from charred meat does potentially have a bit of a role. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. And and what else? So apart from that. Um, you know, the, the other sort of non-dietary lifestyle factors of exercise and sleep also come into it when it comes to um, you know, cancer risk all up. In terms of the diet, other things, I mean, not, we, we touched on not, not eating seed oils, not eating um, trans fats and that sort of thing is, is, is highly relevant. Um, not being diabetic really is, is part of the insulin resistance spectrum as well. So, so they're really the main points. Um, I guess the other one to think about is gastroesophageal reflux, which is a risk factor for esophageal carcinomas. So often people's reflux will improve on a low carb diet, whether it's through weight loss or whether it's because they're not eating certain foods that can aggravate it. Um, so if someone's done that, then in theory, their risk of esophageal and, uh, and potentially gastric cancers goes down. Um, if, if someone's, if a female's got, um, obesity then their risk of endometrial cancer goes up so fixing that through diet might also uh, reduce their risk of getting endometrial cancer which is very closely linked to obesity um, they would be the main areas that we'd sort of think about uh, in terms of risks you could change there now there's obviously genetics which does play a big role in cancer as well and there's again coming back to that um, cape of low carb there's going to be an element of all this that you can't necessarily change with diet so if you've got a very strong family history of a certain cancer, if you've got a BRCA gene, then, you know, absolutely, even if you're on a low carb diet, you should be getting the appropriate cancer screening done. So the BRCA gene is just mm. one gene that's isolated that in increases your risk of yes. certain cancer or all cancers? So predominantly breast cancer. So a, a lot breast. of women who come from a family of um, a BRCA gene positive will either opt to, to have uh, prophylactic mistakes so having surgery before they get a cancer or at the very minimum having very close uh, breast imaging through mammograms, ultrasounds or MRIs even these days uh, on a regular basis. And the BRCA gene does increase the risk of ovarian cancer and in males can increase the risk of a few other types of cancer to a smaller degree, but it's predominantly breast and ovarian. There are some familial uh, bowel cancer syndromes. So patients who come from those families usually are well aware so they get regular colonoscopies and that sort of thing. So um, to my mind, none of the dietary treatments or lifestyle interventions you would institute are going to change, are going to move the needle in a big way for those patients. So they still need to have their cancer screening done. Mm, mm. That's mm. interesting because I've got in my family um, that the the uh, bowel one, um, and you know I think that's been a, a huge reason why my family member has really just won't you know let go of the red meat and cancer link because. He has that mm -hmm. gene, um, yeah. you know, and I guess that's, uh, you know, in a, in a way it's, it could be an unknown, but it's, yeah, it's a very difficult thing, you know, when you have, you've been told you have that, the, the, ga the gastroenterologist says, well, now you've got an increased risk of bowel cancer, so you better cut back mm -hmm. on your red meat. And, and I'm like, well, just read all this stuff. <laughs> he's like, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> mm. It can be hard when you've got yeah. skin in the game, but um, so, yeah, as I've mentioned before mm. in the talk um, that I've done, you know, the, the, the evidence is weak at best. Yeah. So it's very hard yeah. to extrapolate that. And then once you get genetic syndromes or, you know, certain gene mutations involved, it makes it even muddier. So, so no, I wouldn't have any, any particular concerns for someone who's got one of these mutations eating a high red meat diet. Mm. 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 
because the evidence is just mm. so unconvincing and weak. Yeah, yeah, great, yeah. good. Well, it's been fantastic to chat to you today. Um, I love sure. asking um, my guests who they learn from. So who are some of the people that you're currently, you know, really interested in learning what they have seen? Um, so being a Sydney cider, we love Paul Mason. So Paul's been someone <laughs> who everyone will learn from at some stage, no doubt. Um, looking at some of Tom, as I mentioned before, looking at some of Thomas Seyfried stuff, it's really quite mind blowing in the area of cancer. Yeah. So even as someone who trained for many years in, um, in oncology, it's even some of the stuff that he would put out is quite mind blowing and um, even, you know, confronting even for me to sort of think about in terms of how, how different uh, reality might actually be. Um, someone who's not necessarily in the, the low carbohydrate community fully is, is someone like Peter Atia. And um, I find that his, his work and his output is quite interesting because uh, firstly, because he, he's a longevity physician and more and more in our clinic, we are seeing this phenomenon of patients coming to us, not necessarily with a problem to fix. You know, they come and they say, I'm well, but I'm thinking of optimizing for longevity. So I've got no problems now, but I'm thinking not when I'm 35, but I'm thinking that what's going to happen when I'm 85 or 95. And um, we're seeing more of that. So giving these sort of patients this sort of longevity um, type strategy is something that we're doing more and more. So Peter has been a very eminent physician in that area for a long time. So I think he's he's got a lot to um, to offer. And as many of your listeners may be aware, he does sort of push back a little bit on the low carb evangelism a little bit. So it is useful to get that counterpoint sometimes, even if I don't necessarily agree with all of it, it's good to get that counterpoint. I think in the low carb community, sometimes you're a bit at risk of being an echo chamber. So having some some pushback, I think is useful. On the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, someone like Ivor Cummins is, is, is always someone who's good to listen to. He's very, um, he's very honest in terms of his interpretation of the data. He um, doesn't pull punches and he's, you know, he's working into atherosclerosis and blood vessel health is, is, is really interesting and um, very informative and probably, you know, a long yeah. way ahead of the curve for many doctors as well. So the kind of thing that's likely to become more accepted in 10 years, but it's not quite there yet. So it's all very cutting yeah, edge. Yeah, it is. But I love those people. I, I think they're just amazingly brave. And uh, I think we, we have to have them in society. I mean, society would be, yeah, it'd be terrible if we, we censored all those people and we weren't listening to them. Um, you yep. know, in terms of Peter Atia, I've listened to some of his stuff. I love the stuff he did. He did a chat with, um, can't think of the lady now, but on menopause, you know, on estrogen and understanding, you know, the HRT, mm. um, which hopefully I'm going to get to chat to to Dr. Deeper about um, in yep. the, down the track on the podcast because it's another ne- another area that, you know, is full of misinformation. Um, but, yeah, Peter. Yeah, in terms of Peter, just quickly, I know I want to let you go and wrap it up, but in terms of the longevity thing, just in you know, in a sort of quick summary, is there much different difference between what you would be doing, you know, now, you know, like how in terms of someone that wanting longevity? Because I look, I look at myself; I'm pretty metabolically healthy. I've got my autoimmune condition sort of under control. <laughs> you know, what would be different around that compared to what I might be currently doing now? Yeah, I mean, as you've sort of alluded to, being having that sort of healthy lifestyle of being metabolically healthy, whether it's through low carb or whatever else, that's priority number one. Um, I think broadening things out, so not just thinking about diet is important. So, you know, yes, we work yeah. in a low carb clinic, but we do talk to our patients a lot about stress management, sleep, exercise is the other one. So I think, again, the, the low carb community is getting better at this, but for a while there's been this attitude of I can lose weight without exercising. And yes, you can, but you do miss yeah. some of the benefits of exercise, of which weight loss is yeah. not necessarily one of them, but, you know, um, improved muscle mass, um, reduced inflammation, um, you know, all these other things. So exercise is an incredibly powerful tool. And lots of people would talk about the cliche, if exercise is a medication, you prescribe it to everyone. Um, so that's, that's part of it as well. Um, I think in that longevity space, genetics do come into it as well, even more. So in the future, we're going to have more um, genetic tests that we could be offering to patients to really individualise their their long term outlook when it comes to neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's or dementia, um, yeah. cardiovascular disease, obviously, and and cancer and all those things. So if you look at the big killers in society, the things that are going to stop you getting to ninety or ninety five, they are heart disease, 
dementia, cancer, diabetes, they are the big ticket items. They're all associated with insulin resistance. So any longevity strategy has to address insulin resistance one way or another. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's fascinating. I think that's why I call, you know, I mean, I'm in the low carb space, but, you know, I'm very about everything I do is more lifestyle based. And, you know, I yeah. see someone like Peter as exactly the type of person that we do need to listen to because it's never just about one thing. And I think we just, you know, it's very, we limit ourselves <clears throat> when we just look at one thing. You know, there's many pieces to the puzzle and, um, that's why I suppose I just love it as it's just a, the low carb lifestyle and low carb just happens to be that first name, but it does encompass everything else. And that makes it really fun and interesting and, and keeps you learning and keeps you open to just, you know, seeing so much more than what we already know. So it was uh, fantastic to chat to you today, Alex. This has been awesome. What a great conversation. So interesting. Can't thank you enough. Um, and all your details will be below for people if they would like to contact um, Sydney Low Carb Specialists and obviously find you on Instagram as well and Facebook um, and check it out. So I think at the moment being in lockdown, you're obviously, do you, I mean, I do refer my patients to you, some of them in Melbourne. So are you happy to sort of see people from anywhere around Australia? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So yes. our preference is usually if people are local, we see them and do a physical examination. But the reality is most of what we do is, is, is talking. We can send pathology yeah. referrals and that sort of thing remotely. We do remote um, continuous glucose monitors and, and other sort of electronic data like that. So we're absolutely happy doing telehealth, as are our dietitians. So again, they're they're um, both perfectly happy doing telehealth. So remote remote health is, you know, it's been a reality since 2020. Um, so it's and absolutely, we do all of that. Um, we're happy to see your patients if they want to come along. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Alex. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for having me. It's been a great chat, Tracy.